Okay, you guys, welcome back. I hope you had a great time at Oak Park uh, and enjoyed that. On Monday, you will have a quiz, and there may be a question or two related to Oak Park in that quiz. We've, I've been promising you quizzes, and Monday you're going to get one. Uh, at least I promised them the very first day. <laughs> the other thing I want to let you know, originally we were going to be doing a computer-based activity on Monday, but I did get the Chief Scientific Officer to be able to make it on Monday. So we will actually do the activity the following Monday. You'll see some people here with computers. They've been installing some software that will be needed for that activity. I'm going to ask you, though, in um, respect for our speakers, to close your computers. Whoever is done, if you're finishing, let it finish, and then you can give me the CD, and we'll load some of those other ones up during the break. Okay? Uh, today, you're going to get two speakers. First, you're going to have Ana Corbacho, who you've heard speak before. She's going to tell you about <clears throat> molecular biology and how you get organisms to create things for you that you would like them to create. Uh, and then you're going to hear from Frank Schwang, who you met on Monday, and he's going to talk to you about cancer and how biophotonics is related to cancer. Okay? The other thing is, during the break, I would need to talk to you, I've, I've mentioned to you who you are, I need to talk to you about your paper topic, and the rest of you, you're going to have, by the time you get out of this class, you will have your um, assignment set up for the paper, okay? Which means you can start working on your outline, because that'll be the next piece that we have to be working on. And I think uh, Professor Shackelford also mentioned that he was not going to be able to have office hours today, but you're welcome to email him uh, if you need to talk to him, or to me, feel free to... Uh, email me at any time if you want to set up a time to meet and talk about any of the class materials or the Center for Biophotonics and the possibility of internships. And internships, you can also talk to Anna. Okay, without any further introductions, I'm going to get Anna to start talking to you. Yeah, and that's good. Okay. Here we are going to do um, the first hour we're going to talk on molecular biology. And I honestly had a very hard time trying to put uh, an overview of molecular biology in one hour. Um, so I'm going to really go flying over many concepts, but I want to give you kind of the big picture, from the very basic to the very applied thing, for you to have, uh, to have an idea of everything. You probably have heard about these concepts many times, but I'm going to try to put them in order for you, okay? Uh, I'm basically uh, going to touch uh, three main concepts. One will be uh, what is the basic dogma of biology, the language of genetics, and finally genetic engineering, and give a few examples on how, on how molecular biology can be used. So we are starting with the basic dogma of biology. and. Starting with this one. And what I wanted to exemplify here is how do we go from the molecule of DNA that we all know that uh, has the genetic code and has all the information to make us what we are or whatever organism it's represented there. And here what I wanted to, to to pull is an example of the same species but three different individuals. So what is making the DNA expressed in all these differences? And when we are talking about DNA, we are talking about genotypes, the genes, the DNA. So how is the DNA um, being translated or being expressed as a phenotype that is what we see or the characteristics that we see? And that happens because of gene expression and what the result of gene expression are proteins. I don't know if you remember that last class when we were talking about the four biomolecules in biology, the most important ones. We said there were nucleic acids where the DNA is. We said carbohydrates that give the energy. We said lipids that are the ones mainly forming the membranes. And we talked about proteins. And when I said proteins, I said that nothing happens without proteins. Because the DNA by itself cannot do anything if it doesn't, if some proteins don't go and read. 
So as I, as I said, it's like having a library, but nobody opening the books. So how useful is a library if nobody reads what's there? So the way that we go from genotype to phenotype is through gene expression, and the result of that gene expression is protein, but at the same time, the way how the way how that gene expression happens is because proteins are there first. Okay, so the flow of genetic information, you probably have seen this a thousand times. And how is the flow of genetic information happening? So we go from DNA to RNA, and the process of going from the information that is in the DNA to RNA is called transcription. From RNA, we go to protein, and that process is called translation. And that one is the central dogma of biology. Okay? Then, to be able to have a new organism and be able to duplicate that organism, we have to be able to, to duplicate the genetic material. And the process of duplication of the DNA is called replication. So now, for those that may be confused about these names, I invite you to think about this in terms of linguistics. Okay, so what is to, trans to, to do to transcribe? What is it? Without looking there, I shouldn't have put this. Okay, what is to transcribe? To do to write something out. To write something out from to copy it over. To copy it over. That's it. For example, to put something that somebody is saying in written words. That's very good. What is to translate? To convert into from one? From one form into another. And in linguistics is to translate from one language to another language. Great. And what is to replicate? And this is not necessarily linguistics. to copy something exactly the same as it is, okay? So whenever you, sh you have a uh, confusion about transcription, translation, replication, there are many words that sound, dif sound very similar, so go back to the concept where transcription in, in genetics means to synthesize RNA under the direction of DNA. If you think about language, is to convert spoken words into written words. So basically, you are using the same language, but you are expressing it in a different way. So DNA and RNA use basically the same language. Then when you say to translate, is to put in another language, communicating still the same message. It has to be exactly the same to be an accurate trans translation. So in genetics, it means to go from the language that the nucleic acids have, the DNA and the RNA, to put in a different language that is protein language. However, the message that you are translating is exactly the same. Okay? And when you talk about replication, is in linguistics would be to duplicate, to copy, to reproduce something. And in the DNA, we are reproducing the DNA. The same DNA will reproduce the DNA. Okay? Is that clear? And where are these things happening? So, transcription happens in the nucleus, because the DNA is present in the nucleus. The RNA has to be transported or get out of the nucleus to the cytoplasm where translation occurs. The synthesis of proteins is happening in the cytoplasm. And because the DNA is in the nucleus, replication happens in the nucleus, mostly. However, there, is an, there are exceptions. Uh, for example, mitochondria have DNA. And so the, the replication of the DNA of the mitochondria happens outside the nucleus. But that is 
an exception. Okay? In general, replication is in the nucleus. So, now that we have talked about the three basic process, uh, processes in, in molecular biology, we're going to just touch and talk about what is the language of genetics. And as you probably have heard before, uh, there are certain rules for nucleic acids to form base pairs. Uh, in DNA, you have four basic base pairs that are uh, exemplified here by, by a letter. So A is adenine, T is thymine, C is um, cytosine, and G is guanine. So these, these ones, T and A, T and A uh, are able to pair through two hydrogen bonds, and Z and G by three hydrogen bonds. Okay, that is the basic language of DNA. Now, when we go from DNA to RNA, here we are exemplifying a DNA strand in the very up of the figure, and in the bottom we have a copy of RNA. The way this is made is because it's, it's having as a base molecule, the DNA, and the bases are put together in the same order. Again, in the RNA, we have C, A, and G that are the same bases that we have in DNA, but one of the, um, one of the bases is different, and is uracil. That is the little difference between DNA and RNA, little by, by, but huge. And also, another difference that um, we can talk about here is that DNA is a double helix, and RNA is a single strand, in most cases. It can have uh, three-dimensional conformations by, by pairing the bases, but the message is in one single strand. So now, how do we go from RNA to protein? And what is the language? Do you know about this? What is the language uh, that is read in the RNA into proteins? How is it? If we, all of them. From, uh, it would be mRNA into proteins. So how am I reading the RNA to form a protein? In terms of language, we are saying that DNA is GGTA, okay? RNA is ZGTU. And now, how do I read the RNA into proteins? You have ribosomes and tRNA. And what is the code that... They're going to peptides. So what, what I wanted to say is how is the language read exactly, and it's in triplet code, okay, and, or, or the genetic code. What does, does it mean is here we have, again, the DNA strand with the complementary bases in the RNA, and how is this message read into protein? The RNA means amino acids. Like, how many bases in the RNA are one amino acid? Three. three. So every three, every three bases in the RNA, it's what means is one amino acid. Okay? And that is the genetic code. That is what we know as genetic code. So then in the, in the sequence of a protein, in the sequence of, of the DNA, we have one letter corresponding to one letter in the RNA, but when we go from RNA to protein, we have three letters corresponding to each amino acid in protein. And what is, that is what we call the universal genetic code. Okay, here we have all the possible combinations of bases 
in the RNA, because that's what's going to be read as proteins, and what, what is the correspondence in the kind of amino acid. And as you can see here, there are certain triplets that mean something else. They don't necessarily mean an amino acid, but it, mean, it means stops. Stop. It means that that's the end of the sequence. Okay? So that is what we call the, call the genetic code. Is there any questions so far? Okay. So now how is each, pro, each of those processes happening? And I'm not going to go into too much detail in this class because uh, we probably need a whole course of molecular biology to go over all the details. But I just want to give you the um, very fast idea of what's going on. And we're going to start here in the process of transcription, how the DNA goes into RNA. The transcription uh, of DNA to RNA has three steps, initiation, elongation, and termination. And the main protein uh, that is doing the, the transcription is the polymerase, this RNA polymerase. So what it does, this RNA polymerase, it binds to a specific site of the DNA called promoter. And to be able to find this place in the, to be able to find this place in the, in the gene, it needs the signal of many other proteins that sit here. I will turn into the old style. Cannot do it. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so what happens is for this RNA polymerase to find the beginning of the gene that is going to uh, trans, uh, transcribe, uh, it needs to find a, a bunch of proteins sitting on the promoter. Okay. Once the RNA polymerase, polymerase sits on the DNA, it starts opening the double helix, starts opening, and it starts copying for each base on DNA, one base on RNA. And that is what initiation is, getting the polymerase there and a bunch of other proteins here on the promoter. Uh, elongation is the production of the uh, RNA strand. And the termination is when the RNA polymerase gets to a sequence called stop sequence. It stops transcribing and lets the RNA go. Once the polymerase is out, the uh, R DNA tends to close itself. Okay, that is basically and very fast what transcription is. And the main, the main protein here is the RNA polymerase. Um, I'm saying this in a very fast way, but the amount of work that took to discover this kind of thing it was huge. And actually, the RNA polymerase was one of the most important molecules discovered that really allowed the field to start and glow. Because just to be able to have one protein to copy from DNA to RNA was huge. Imagine that we can produce that protein and we can do whatever we want with it. And we'll go uh, into that in, uh, when we do genetic engineering. Now I'm going to talk about the process of translation that is going from mRNA to protein. This process, transcription, is happening in the nucleus. Okay? So once you have the, the messenger RNA, in this case, this messenger RNA needs to go outside the nucleus and then translation can happen. And this is only one theme about it. Translation also has an initiation step, an elongation step, and a termination step. And what basically what happens here is the RNA, messenger RNA, and what happens is that uh, the ribosomes, that you may remember that ribosomes have two subunits, a small subunit and a big subunit. These subunits are made by uh, a little piece of RNA that is called ribosomal RNA and a bunch of proteins but it's a complex that works all together. So the first thing that happens is that small subunit gets in touch with, um, with the RNA, and that small subunit is already bringing a, a transfer RNA. So in this image, we are talking about three different types of, types of RNA. The messenger RNA, that is the one that has the code for the protein, 
the ribosomal RNA that is part of the structure of the ribosome and the transfer RNA that is the one that is going to be able to read, uh, to identify the message and add a, a, an amino acid and is doing that by having an anticodon. If we said that three bases in the RNA form a codon, then to be able to read that, we have an anticodon that pairs to this, and it corresponds to a specific amino acid. So we have one type of uh, transfer RNA for each amino acid. Is that right? So once we have the whole complex uh, all together, and we can start with the elongation process, that is the ribosome will move in this direction and for each three bases it will add an amino, an amino acid. And here is the chain of amino acids of being formed, the chain of the, of the polypeptide or protein. Okay? So for each of these processes, at the end of the class, I, you will see a list where I recommend certain animations to be able to see the whole process in movement and with more detail but we won't have time to do all of them right now. That's why I'm just flying over this. But basically, for translation, the concepts are there are three types of RNA. Uh, the molecule of uh, messenger RNA is being read and transformed into a chain of amino acids or polypeptides. Okay? Now, what happens with a polypeptide and is a polypeptide always a complete protein, functional protein? Why? Um, I don't know. <laughs> okay. There are there are different examples. There are different examples. There are cases where the information of that, it, that you find in one mRNA gives a whole protein because you only need one polypeptide to form a protein. Uh, like, for example, albumin. It's only one polypeptide. But, for example, there are other proteins like hemoglobin that is formed by different subunits. And each of those subunits is a polypeptide. Okay? Many times uh, you will hear that whenever we are talking about polypeptides, it's the same as talking about protein, but there is a difference. Polypeptide is one chain of amino acids. Protein can be one chain or can be many subunits working together. But protein is the whole uh, functional thing. Okay? So now, uh, for replication, I'm going to put an animation because it's a little bit more complex and I want all the, the things going on there. So, um, let me find it. DNA activities. Do you have any questions so far? DNA synthesis is similar in all organisms, but let's look at the details of this process in the bacterium E. coli. DNA synthesis begins at a particular location on the chromosome, where proteins open the DNA into a bubble of single-stranded DNA. The strands are antiparallel to each other, meaning that the three prime end of one strand points in the same direction as the five prime end of the other. Enzymes, called helicases, enter the bubble and continue to unwind the DNA. The open DNA provides the replication machinery access to the nucleotides in the strands. Proteins, called single-strand binding proteins, bind to the open DNA and prevent the strands from closing back together. Keep in mind that as the helix opens in one region, it becomes overwound in others. An enzyme called topoisomerase nicks the DNA and then untwists and reseals it to relieve this tension. Enzymes called primases enter the replication bubble. 
Primase adds a short segment of complementary RNA to the single-stranded regions of template DNA. The RNA primers are anti-parallel to the template strands they are attached to. Helicase continues to open the double helix and primase follows behind. The RNA primers provide hydroxyl groups at their three prime ends. These groups are necessary for DNA polymerase to add additional nucleotides to the chain. The DNA polymerase that E. coli uses for this purpose is called DNA polymerase 3. As DNA polymerase 3 elongates each strand in the 5' prime to 3' prime direction, helicase continues to unwind the double helix. Notice that one strand, called the leading strand, elongates continuously in the direction of the Wolbeck replication bubble. The DNA polymerase on the opposite strand travels in the opposite direction. Therefore, the primase must make additional primers for this strand as the replication bubble widens. DNA polymerase 3 adds nucleotides to the new primer. Primase continues to add new primers as the bubble widens. The fragments of DNA produced on this strand have been named Okazaki fragments. Each fragment is 1,000 to 2,000 bases long. Together, they make up what is known as the lagging strand. DNA synthesis is still not complete because the new strands have segments of RNA in them. An enzyme called DNA polymerase 1 removes the RNA nucleotide by nucleotide and adds DNA nucleotides in its place. Notice that small gaps are left in the new strands of DNA. An enzyme called DNA ligase seals these gaps, linking the fragments by covalent bonds. Although the DNA is shown here in flattened form for clarity, the DNA actually assumes a double helix form as it is synthesized. DNA synthesis is complete. So now, all these details, and why do we not want to know all these amount of details? Why do you think it's important to... Why do you think it's useful, more than important, to understand what is each of these proteins doing on the DNA or on the RNA? Exactly. So if you know exactly what each of these proteins is doing and how is it's doing it, you can add, use the different components in different ways to build or to change things. So you need to know that an RNA polymerase, what it's going to do is going, it's going to produce RNA over a DNA. It's going to copy the, the message. Uh, you need to know that a DNA polymerase will do DNA on DNA. And you need to know that, for example, there's something called ligase that will close a nick or attach two extremes of the DNA. And this kind of thing is very important because if you want in the laboratory to be able to add two pieces of DNA, you need to link them. And to be able to link them, you need a ligase. So that's why it's important to understand what is each of these molecules doing um, in the case of a molecular biologist. In your case, I'm just exemplifying this to let you know how each of these little steps allowed the next thing that I'm going to show. Do, do you have any, any question about uh, replication? You can watch this uh, animation several times. And then before I end this, this part of explaining very basic molecular biology, I wanted to um, put it in context again. And talk about the cell cycle and when in the cell cycle all these processes are happening. Okay? The cell cycle, the cell cycle is from the division of a cell to the next division of a cell. And it has two main uh, big phases. The M phase where mitosis happens and we are not going to go into all these steps today. But basically it's the obvious di di uh, division of the cell and then the interface that it has three main uh, phases on the interface. That is G1, S phase, and G2 
phase. And so when in this cycle is replication happening, F phase is the DNA synthesis phase. Only in this moment, the DNA is being replicated. When is the uh, transcription happening? Transcription and translation, where are they happening? G2, and how is the cell growing? From, from finishing the cell division, the cell needs to grow, get a lot of nutrients, be able to be, be big enough to be able to duplicate again. So, all the machinery to do the cell growth are, is made of proteins. So, transcription and translation is happening in most, in, mainly on G1 and G2, a little bit is happening on the S synthesis, and most of it is stopped during the cell division. Most of it, but not all. Okay? So, basically, replication is S synthesis, transcription and translation is G1 and G2, also in, in, during the S phase, and kind of stops during the M phase. Okay? So now, let's go to genetic engineering and how all this knowledge can be used to do something. And I'm putting again this plant that is the, uh, the example I used during the last class, an artificial bioluminescence induced by genetic engineering of a tobacco plant. Um, and because of the universal genetic code it is possible to program one species to produce proteins characteristic of another species by transplanting DNA. In this case, we have we trans the, the, um, the gene that was introduced in this tobacco plant was uh, um, luciferase that was coming probably from an insect. And the plant is producing light that normally it wouldn't be producing. So now, this can sound a little bit, um, not a little bit, a lot, a lot like science fiction. And what is the meaning and why we want to be doing this kind of thing? Not necessarily making a plant glow, but how are, is this technology useful in medicine, for example? So first, let's talk about what genetic engineering means. And here I put a, a photo of Dolly, the Jeep, the first cloned. Uh, organism, mam mam mammal, actually. Uh, and then here, as probably a picture you've seen many times, that is a fertilized egg where that is in the tip of a pipette, and here there's a needle where it, that is going to be used to inject something in that egg. So what, what, what is really genetic engineering and what, what it implies? Genetic engineering or genetic modification, GM, and gene splicing are terms for the process of manipulating genes, generally in, implying that the process is outside the organism's natural reproductive process. Okay, we are interfering with the uh, organism's natural process. It involves the isolation, manipulation, and reintroduction of DNA into cells or modern organisms, usually to express a protein. And the aim for, for this technology is to introduce new characteristics or attributes physiologically or physically, such as making a crop resistant to a herbicide, introducing a novel trait, or producing a new protein or enzyme along with altering the organism to produce more of certain traits. This is just a little list of examples of how uh, genetic engineering has been used. And I want to touch into a few examples. And when I, when I uh, was faced to put this class together, and I was thinking, okay, what is really genetic engineering and how much I can tell you about it? because it involves so many, so many, so many things that it's kind of hard to simplify it. And here I, I put a list of techniques that are used in genetic engineering. And it's a list that, um, it's, a, it's a small list, and then you have to add the possibility of combining all these techniques between them to create different processes. So it's not like I, I can sit here and tell you, 
the process of genetic engineering something is like this because we can go from here to here to here to here it's really every process to put a gene in a different organism can change depending what are you using and for what okay so it's not like a recipe for this and then when we're talking about applications we uh, we can we can reduce these applications into gene products, making something produce a protein that you need. For example, insulin, human growth hormone, uh, bovine somatotropin, renin, all these are hormones. And these are hormones that you can, if you have a deficiency, you can go to the doctor and the doctor will give you this hormone. Where do you think the hormone is coming from? They are not killing other humans to get the hormone to put it in a pill to give it to you. They are producing this protein somewhere else, and they are using genetic engineering to produce that protein. Okay? Uh, I'm going to give an example here that is the production of human growth hormone. And then another application can be the production of new genotypes, meaning changing the aspect of something. And here we can have things like making a crop resistance to an herbicide or a, or a pesticide. Or, um, uh, uh, an infection, making it resistant to an infection so you don't use herbicides or you, know, you don't use pesticides. Uh, it can be used for gene therapy. For example, when uh, you are missing one gene and you have a disease because you, are, you are, have a mutation in that gene and it doesn't work, uh, the idea is to be able to reintroduce this gene in your organism. And one of the examples that is probably the most advanced right now is on cystic fibrosis. Um, cystic fibrosis is a disease um, that uh, really affects your respiratory system. And what is causing this disease is w the mutation on one protein. It's a channel, a um, uh, chlorox channel in, in your cells. And the main phenotype is that you have uh, horrible lung problems. The, the lungs become very fibrotic. So there's no really contraction and relaxation. The, the air cannot flow really well. So they, these, these kids in general, because they don't, they used to not to live too far, um, they, they have a horrible kind of life because that is constantly not being able to breathe. And the only way to help them has been normally to do physical therapy. Okay? And so the idea is, okay, this, these kids are missing one protein. How can we introduce it back? And I'm going to show an animation on this that, um, that may give you an idea of how this can happen. Um, unfortunately, this doesn't have... Um, this doesn't have volume, it doesn't have voice, but the idea is to use what we know about viruses. We know that a virus is, has, in, in the inside has a strand of uh, nucleic acid for its own information, and it's covered by proteins. That The idea of these proteins is that allows the virus to stick to the cell membrane and to be able to inject or let the RNA or the DNA go into the cell. Once, th once this piece of uh, nucleic acid is inside the cell, the cell is confused and it starts producing proteins from that piece that doesn't belong to it. But it, the cell doesn't know, so it starts producing the proteins. And the virus is taking advantage of the cell machinery. So the idea is to use the, um, the, this idea of the virus to be able to put a gene that can be useful for the cell. So what if we eliminate from the DNA of the virus all those proteins that can cause infection? And we just leave those genes that allow the DNA to go in. And that's it. So the virus becomes a way of delivery. Stops being a means of infection, but it's a way of delivering DNA. Let me see. Uh, 
So here what he's doing is eliminating all the pieces of the DNA of the virus that was in red that we don't need anymore, and it, we added the piece of DNA that we want to express. So now what you, what you do with that is you culture this virus to produce a lot of those viruses, and then we can use those ones to infect the cells we want. And I'm going to stop with this animation because it's really not as fast as I want it to be. But the idea is, okay, now we have a virus that is a way of delivering a gene. And I have a disease that is happening in the airways. So, how do I put that virus in? Any ideas? Nebulizer. That's why uh, respiratory diseases are a good target for genetic therapy, because we can do it very locally. You can get the virus in through a nebulizer, through a way of uh, um, pulverizing it and getting in with, it, we, with your air that is going in. And then if we get those viruses to get in the right cells, and the cells are, are start, start producing the protein I tell them to produce, then they have the protein. Now, the problem is that how do we make the cell to really keep that protein forever? That's a, a little bit of a limitation because you can be using the nebulizer, the, the cell is making some proteins, but then it ends up degrading that, and we need to be able to keep it for the new cells that reproduce and keep the DNA. But this is one idea of how um, molecular engineering can make use of all what we know to change something and deliver a drug. That is, it's not really a drug because it's giving you back what you need. So it's not adding up uh, all the uh, side effects of, of pharmaceutical components that can sometimes be devastating in other uh, parts of the body, but it's giving in a localized way what you need and is in the... Um, the sequence is what you should have and you don't have. Now I'm going to give you another example that is how, um, how all this technology was really amazing to produce hormones. And let me give you this. And I would invite you to see uh, the whole animation when you're at home at some point. Uh, these four points are really great. I'm just going to show the overview. And this is uh, the, the story of the growth hormone is very close to my own. Near the brain. base of the brain, a pea-sized structure called the pituitary gland secretes a variety of hormones into the bloodstream. Some of the pituitary cells secrete growth hormone. Let me do it again. Come on. Come on. Near the base of the brain, a pea-sized structure called the pituitary gland secretes a variety of hormones into the bloodstream. Some of the pituitary cells secrete growth hormone, which stimulates growth during childhood. Children who produce little or no growth hormone end up short in stature, a phenomenon called pituitary dwarfism. However, they can grow to normal heights if they take growth hormone during their growing years. How did scientists produce this supply of human growth hormone? Essentially, they mimicked in the laboratory what certain pituitary cells do in the brain. In these cells, the growth hormone gene, called GH1, is transcribed into mRNA, and the mRNA is then translated into the growth hormone protein. The laboratory project to produce human growth hormone had three main parts. First, the scientists created a cDNA library which is a collection of genes that are expressed by a sample of cells. Second, 
they screened the library to find the growth hormone gene. Finally, after finding the gene, they placed the gene in bacteria for gene expression. In other words, the bacteria transcribed and translated the gene, thereby acting as microscopic growth hormone factories. So this is an example of how uh, hormones are being produced by genetic engineering. And for example, if you think about diabetics, uh, they cannot live without insulin. And the way of getting insulin is the cheapest way and the fastest way of getting exactly the sequence of insulin they need is from genetic engineering. There, there used to be another way of producing it that was from pigs because the sequence of the, of the insulin from pigs and the human insulin are very similar but not exactly the same. But then you have to isolate it from pigs that is uh, not less cruel than uh, doing it in a bacteria. So in a way, there are ups and downs about genetic engineering, but when it's proper, properly used, uh, it's really very useful and really can make a huge difference. Then, I'm going to continue with the examples. You probably have heard about knockout mice. Have you? If not, I will introduce them to you. Uh, what is a transgenic organism? What is it? You probably have heard about transgenic corn and... Say it. Okay. A transgenic organism is an organism that has been manipulated by molecular biology and it can either lack one of the normal genes and in that case we call knockout organism or it can be uh, made produce one new gene that wasn't there. Okay, that in the, in the case that I have just shown you. One of, that is, is a very popular technique in, in biology right now, it's uh, the use of knockout mice. And why are we using so many knockout mice to try to understand uh, human disease? Why are we using mice? They? They mature quickly, they reproduce, there are a lot of mice, but can, can we really compare what's happening in a mouse to what's happening in a human? To a certain extent, we can. And that is because of the universal genetic code, because the proteins present in the mouse and the proteins present in the humans are basically exactly the same, with certain differences, because that's why they look as mice and we look as humans, but... Uh, but many, <laughs> but the, the sequence of many, many proteins is the same, and the way they work is very, very similar. So we are using the mouse as a tool to understand how it works, and then when we understand how it works in the mouse, we try to see if it really works in the same way in humans, and we try to draw the, the, the comparisons. So a tool that has been used in the last 10 years quite a lot is the use of knockout mice. And what it's doing is, knock, it produces the knockout of a gene in in the genome, genome of a mouse. Here is an example of uh, a knockout mouse that is missing the plasminogen um, peptide. Plasminogen is um, involved in coagulation. And this was a surprising phenotype for plasminogen because you wouldn't expect a dwarf coming up of a mistake in coagulation. And by using the knockout mice, uh, there are a lot of functions in proteins that have been discovered that we didn't know before. So we, we have classified proteins in certain areas because it was the very obvious thing that we discovered them for. But then, through the use of this kind of technology, all of a sudden we see other possibilities and understand better what's going on. And I'm going to fly over these just to jo show you the amount of... Uh, techniques that you can use to make a uh, knockout mouse. And um, so we start here <coughs> with the original mouse by extracting embryonic stem cells from the original mouse. We get the stem cells 
and we get them to uh, we, we change one gene in these stem cells. Once we change the stem cells, we can put them back into an embryo of a, a host mother that normally is of a different color, and we put these stem cells inside the embryo of the blastocyst. Once these cells are incorporated in the, in the host uh, embryo, they are up at a point that they can still get inside and reaccommodate in the blastocyst because it's a very early embryo with a few cells. So they reaccommodate here and they are implanted into a mother, a surrogate mother. Okay? So then this mother will have these little uh, mice that have two different colors because the original mouse was black the embryo that I used was brown and the mother was white. So I know if I have little mice that are combined between black and brown, those ones are the mixed embryos. Okay? From this, that, that this animal has a combination of cells. The black cells have the mutation. The brown cells don't have any mutation. They are totally fine. And it's a mosaic animal. It, it normally has no problems because other cells compensate what, for what is missing, but it's happy. It's just colorful. So then from mixing two of these chimeras, we get through Mendelian um, genetics, we get to get some mice that are perfectly normal, that are all black, we just, you just take the black ones and then the others, you don't want them because you, you know that the others are not what, you, what you're needing. Some mice are heterozygous, that means that they have one copy of the mutated gene and one copy of the perfect gene. Uh, and then you have one in four animal that it will be homozygous, they have the mutation in both. And one of the uh, limitations, of, limitations of this technology is that when you're dealing with a gene that is really important, during development, you don't have this one because it will die during development. It will never be, be able to be born because if you are dealing, for example, with a growth factor that is very important for the cells to move from uh, the blastocyst to form then the gastrula and that gene is not there, the embryo just stops growing. Okay, so this technology has been used quite a lot in the last few years. Do you have any question about this? Want to make any comment? I mean, it, it sounds kind of creepy, but yeah. How do you know which mouse is which? Because of the color. But are all black ones? Oh, sorry, that part, yes. At this point, they are all black, but we don't know if they have incorporated or not the mutation. So at this point, you have to genotype. So what you do is, or you can either do it with blood or with a little, normally what is done is uh, the little tip of the tail is being clipped and when they are really, really, really young, the tail is still not, it has no bone, so it's, it's not painful. In the, you have a window where the pain is not uh, that intense or that important and the tail, it's genotype and they will know by the, they really will look at the sequence of the gene that you are looking for. And then you will select which are the homozygous and these other ones will uh, serve to keep reproducing between them to be able to have uh, homozygous. And then in, in any experiment you need to have, you need to compare the control animal that is wild type or doesn't have the mutation against the homozygous. And then in many cases, because the homozygous doesn't survive in development, you can use the heterozygous to see how only one copy of that gene is really affecting the development or the disease you want to figure out. Okay. And we've seen this before. It's the story of the green fluorescent protein and how uh, it, 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 we can think about one protein that we want to follow in one cell or in one organism and this is the, the example of the protein then we can incorporate the sequence of green fluorescent protein to one extreme of it 
and get the cell to make the protein plus the uh, green fluorescent protein attached to it. There are many examples of this. We saw last, last class the glowfish that is probably one of the most controversial ones because it was made for, um, as a pet. It was made for just for kind of fun. And it doesn't have mm, mm, like a good higher idea of how, why it was made. Uh, then we have the example of uh, the C. elegans that is used in, in molecular and, and developmental biology a lot. We have an example here of using green fluorescent protein in mice. And these are just little uh, mice just born. They, they don't have hair yet. And when the, the UV light is used to, uh, on them, then they fluoresce. And the way they did this was, it was a, a, another way of doing the recognition that we sh have just seen in the knockout animals, where we were using the outside color of the animal that is sometimes tricky because the color of the, of the hair implies semi several genes acting there. In this case, they used the green fluorescent protein to show that these animals are completely transfected. And it's a way of following how uh, the transfection went. Okay. Um, this is another example of using green fluorescent protein and a combination of green and red in the tumor in a rat. You can see the tumor that is uh, fluorescing, fluorescing in, in red. And then here, how the blood vessels are distributed in the tumor. And you probably have heard uh, in, the, in the past few years, and if not, I can tell you that in the last 10, uh, ten years, I would say there, there was a big push about understanding how the blood vessels grow into a tumor. Because when you have a, a cell, and that's probably something that, that Frank is going to talk about, when you have a cell that starts dividing like crazy, to be able to, it starts producing a tumor. But for that tumor to grow, it needs nutrients. And if blood vessels don't come to the tumor, the tumor doesn't grow. So how is that the, the vessels go there? You can study by doing this. And I'm done. So, yes. Yeah, I almost got that picture. Yeah. So, um, there are some recommended animations that I wanted to show, but we don't have time to go over them. So if you want to see a little bit more of this, you can go to these websites. And for everything that I have shown, I have the website in each page, so you can uh, get more information there. So um, I know that the whole idea of genetic engineering is uh, out there all the time, and people are really afraid of it, because I think it's a problem of understanding how it works and the ethical problems related to it. I would say that it can be good and bad depending how you use it, like everything else. And to completely eliminate the possibility of doing it is kind of silly because you are also eliminating the, the possibility of doing a lot of good with it. Like being able to give uh, a treatment for these kids that have cystic fibrosis wouldn't be possible if all these research uh, wasn't been able to, to be done. So everything is relative and it's not like, okay, let's ban everything that is genetically modified. Because if we do that, the people that are uh, insulin dependent will have to go back to the getting from the pigs and then it's going to be cruel. So it's like everything is very relative. Okay? That's the political message I have to give.